the uh, union that's been seeking to gain recognition at the FCA and claims to have some number of members there is balloting those members for strike action. Psychologically, if that's the right word, within the regulator, there's been quite a big shift, which is obviously at least partly, probably mostly triggered by the sort of consultation on changing terms and conditions, which is pay rise, as I understand it, is pay rises for some, but no pay rises, no bonus and some cuts for others. What it is the, the, the FCA is, is trying is trying to be, and it's given some examples under each of those headings. So it, one of those headings is to be more innovative. And the example they gave there, one example was uh, cancelling the permissions of 176 firms. Before Christmas, we had a little flowy. We had another uh, FCA action, this time against HSBC for anti-money laundering weaknesses. This is the first big move, is it not, into the FCA getting its hands on crypto. Hi, and welcome to the Grant Thorne Risk and Regulation Unraveled podcast uh, featuring Gavin Stewart. Hi there. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Gavin. And myself, David Moy. Uh, this is the podcast where we take a monthly look at what the financial services regulators are doing and saying and try and answer the questions that I think even Sue Gray would be too scared to, to answer or too busy, perhaps, to answer. Um, and that is, what does uh, the activity of our uh, financial service regulators mean for those of us working in the industry? Um, now, our last podcast was before Christmas, and it's been a busy time since then. I, I based that on a number of facts, one being that my Twitter feed has blown up on a daily basis um, with FCA announcing, ooh, new fines, new bans, uh, new policy. Um, I know we've talked in the past about the uh, FCA transformation program and its commitment to digitization. Uh, I'd just like to say if, if, if that if that means going viral on Twitter, then they've certainly they've certainly hit that target. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it has been useful. It has kept me uh, kept me up to date on what has been going on. Um, uh, now, uh, not featuring too heavily within the Twitter feed itself are some of the news stories that have, have, have been appearing regarding, um, if I can call it, internal FCA matters. Um, I see, for instance, this morning, uh, Unite, the uh, union that's been seeking to gain recognition at the FCA and claims to have some number of members there, is balloting those members for strike action. Um, I think that's a first. I don't know. You've been doing this longer than I have. <laughs> have we seen a strike in a, within a, one of the regulators? Uh, so it's it's easily a first. Um, when the FSA was formed back in 98, uh, it deliberately chose not to have a union and to have a staff consultative committee. And there was something like, at the time, something like a third of um, people who came across from the various organisations were union members at the time, but which wasn't enough to trigger automatic recognition. Um, it, it does feel like quite a big deal, actually, because I think it 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 signifies that um, psychologically, if that's the right word, within the regulator, there's been quite a big shift which is obviously at least partly, probably mostly triggered by the sort of consultation on changing terms and conditions, which is pay rise, as I understand it, is pay rises for some, but no pay rises, no bonus, and some cuts for others. Um, you know, which is qu obviously quite a big deal if, if that's you. Oh, absolutely, yes, yes. I, I, I mean, it's certainly being reported uh, we're in different ways by different <laughs> by, by different people are looking at it through different lenses, but it's clearly uh, it's clearly uh, upset enough of people that that you know unionisation suddenly seems to be uh, on the table. Um, whether this is just a blip and uh, you know consultation will lead to you know sort of resolution of some of these disgruntlement, I don't know, uh, but it does bear watching. Um, yes. I, I, I think I, I don't. I was going to say the thing I don't get is what sort of organisation the FCA wants to be after this. So they've talked about um, improving the pay of their lower paid staff, which is fine. Uh, but we're talking, you know, regulating the financial services industry, which, as we you know, is clearly pretty well remunerated. Um, and how you attract the right people and retain them from that industry in order to regulate it. It's yes. not like a lot of other regulated industries in that respect, I think is is a real challenge. Um, and it's not it's not obvious at the moment. It's not transparent. 
what the FCA leadership um, plan to do in order to kind of create an effective regulator for the sort of industry it's responsible for. Yes. Well, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting another piece of news we saw is, is related to remuneration, um, but it's uh, something I thought we should note, uh, which is the um, FCA's chief operating officer, mm -hmm. um, who I believe joined from BlackRock actually uh, uh, in about May uh, last year, I think, um, and, and, and is being reported as having having resigned. Um, so. Uh, that's some turnover in in the executive team after a relatively short period of time. Um, uh, with with that, the the chief operating officer role being assigned, as we understand it, to Emily Shepherd, who um, has been the director of authorizations for some time, has we understand recently picked up the um, transformation director role with Megan Butler departing, and uh, and now it looks like she might also be picking up the chief operating officer. Role. I don't know on a on an interim or permanent basis. I'm not sure how that will be structured, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, uh, it's an interesting uh, interesting development. Have you got any uh, any observations on it, uh, Gavin? I, I mean, I, the thing I saw in City AM, I think it was emphasised. It wasn't to do um, uh, the departure wasn't to do with the transformation, but but it's clearly not great. Um, for the organization uh, and doing three jobs that were meant to be done by three senior people is is obviously not ideal either. Uh, and you come back again to the fact that it's a very, very new uh, exco. Mm. I think only Mark Stewart has been at the FCA for more than three or four years. Yes. Um, and the majority of them have joined within the last 18 months. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of questions there that at yeah. the moment we just don't have the answer to. Yeah, yeah, it's no, so clearly a rocky <laughs> period. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, any time will tell. We've we've, we've seen organisations, you know, in 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 the private sector, in the public sector, go through uh, go through rocky periods and come out. Come out looking stronger, so this may be the case here, but it's certainly a certainly a difficult time um, for the FCA. Um, uh, having said that, they did put up a segueing here to a slightly different uh, angle on FCA activity. They did put up a a, a web page uh, in early January uh, entitled "Highlights of the FCA's New Approach in 2021," um, which is which is basically a page of, of, of web text and a, and a handy infographic. Um, I think this is a first. I'm not outside of the annual business plan. I haven't really seen a, uh, seen the FCA produce a sort of a, this is what we've accomplished um, kind of narrative. Um, I did I did find it interesting the the infographic has got it's basically got three headings to uh, you know, um, structure you know what it is the, the the FCA is trying is trying to be and it's given some examples under each of those headings. So it, one of those headings is to be more innovative and. The example I gave there, one example was uh, cancelling the permissions of 176 firms to be more yeah. assertive. And the example there was 568 million pounds worth of fines and to be more adaptive. An example there was uh, the business interruption court case and the 1.2 billion in claims payments, um, which which I came away thinking, uh, yeah, interesting that more uh, innovative, more assertive, and more adaptive will basically come down to. <laughs> <laughs> more fines, more court cases, and more bans. Um, so, what what what's, what should be our takeaway from this? Uh, I mean, is 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 this a, is this a good move on the FCA's part to put this kind of thing together? Does it perhaps, you know, fit with a narrative that says the FCA is going to become more enforcement led? It's all about you know the punishment. So I I don't know really where to start with this. I'm kind of torn because I'm I'm. I'm very much in favour of being more transparent and having, you know, more hard numbers around, you know, what what's actually been going on. Um, it does. I'm also, however, quite wary of any regulator at any time being uh, at all triumphalist. Uh, I used to be very nervous when I was there and and looking from the outside, I'm no less nervous now. So you look at some of the stuff, it's a bit of a curate egg of 
of picking and choosing mm. uh, some of the things like uh, you know the 179 firms that you recognize that you kind of highlight as having their permissions cancelled. I mean that just sounds like housekeeping mm. to me, if I'm honest. Um, I mean I know it's it's part of the LCF report. They talk about um, stopping you know four million pounds being lost to scams. Yes. That's not a big number in the great scheme of things. Um, I'm very wary of using a single example to generalize. Um, enforcement cases, which I know we're going to come on to, are are potentially quite um, misleading because they're things that started, I think, in some cases, 10 years ago. Yes. So they're long run things. And, and there's always questions about, you know, um, did they pick the right cases? Is it really a deterrent? Um, you know, yep. your question about enforcement led is is a is a good one, um, but but there's just not enough to go on um, in in terms of answering it. Uh, so I hope they follow up on it. I hope they give us year on year um, trend. You know, year on year numbers of the same things. Because if they just keep picking and choosing the ones that are are most attractive at the time, then that will come back to bite them. Uh, so, like I say, I, I like the transparency, but it's it's a long way from being an annual report or what you would you know what you would want to see in an annual report. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't necessarily align to you know the super easy priorities. I mean, some do, but I mean there were, there were things like uh, you know mortgage prisoners, for instance, which yep. um, is is recognised and you know featured as a. As, a, as an area they want, they want to work out, frankly, it's been <laughs> has been for, for years, uh, and that's obviously not appearing in the infographic. There's nothing, uh, you know, nothing being put uh, published in terms of an outcome there. That no, and uh, pensions is you know which which you spend a lot of time on. That's not mentioned at all either, which is one of the more painful areas of FCA activity at the moment. So it, it's not a, it's not, I don't think it's a, you could say it was a balanced picture. I don't think they would claim it was a balanced picture, but, but as I say, I'm just wary of the language being a bit too gung ho. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, maybe it is in keeping with all those, those, those Twitter, um, Twitter headlines that I receive in sort of a, a highly summarized greatest hits type of, um, approach to communicating, uh, I suppose it fits within that, within that context, perhaps. Um, you're right, we are going to talk a bit about enforcement because uh, no sooner had we um, uh, stuffed a mince pie into our mouth and stuffed our arm up the turkey to, to get it ready for, for cooking, the uh, enforcement notices uh, uh, started dropping. Um, actually, even before that, we had seen the NatWest criminal anti-money laundering case conclude. So we talked about that in our last podcast and there was a, obviously a fine, court-imposed fine attached to that. Um, and then before Christmas, we had a little flowy. We had another uh, FCA action, this time against HSBC for anti-money laundering weaknesses. Uh, you go back to 2010, uh, 64 million pounds. Um, so that was not a criminal prosecution. That was uh, that was uh, that was the FCA taking enforcement action. We also saw two drop from the PRA uh, against banks, both for regulatory reporting failures, essentially, which 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 we know has been a um, a concern of, of the regulators, the Bank of England PRA for quite a long time, and there's you know, has been a lot of activity, skilled person reviews, etc. Uh, but they got around to finding standard chartered for, I think, liquidity reporting failures and Metro Bank for capital reporting failures. Um, so, I mean, no need, I think, to, to delve into the detail of, of any of those, other than to say, there's two themes there, you know, reg, reg reporting on the banking side of things and AML, or also on the banking side of things, but, but FCA side of the, the house. Um, so two, two, two themes and a big flurry before Christmas, you know, should I be concluding that uh, those themes are going to um, feature, uh, you know, even more so in 2022? Um, and uh, should I expect a, an ongoing flurry of announcements? Um, so I think it's, I don't think so is the short answer. Um, I think these things tend to have a life of their own. Um, and if you trace the, the kind of the story arc of each case, they're quite different. Um, I, I think that it's, 
it's unusual and not ideal to have so many dropping just before Christmas and all together. Um, so the AML one with NatWest was obviously out of their control because it was a court case and, and so on, but they knew roughly the timing. So I think, you know, they drew, they all fell within about a week of Christmas. One was on a Friday. Um, they're not exactly designed to get, you know, high levels of attention. That's a good point, actually. Yes, yes, yes. If you're trying to make a, trying to get people's attention, it's not, from a news cycle point of view, it's not an ideal timing uh, in many ways. But as you say, they would have controlled the timing on some of those, some of those cases. So I, I don't know whether they just thought it was too late. They wanted to get it out of the way. Um, whether there's other, whether there are other things coming up, but you know they they were you know taking a hit before Christmas to avoid a bigger one after Christmas. But who knows? Um, it doesn't it doesn't look like an obvious plan. And obviously you know obviously you know these things you can only want to be able to control them a little bit. Um, there's due process and so on and so forth, but it it doesn't look from the outside as though there's a lot of strategy involved in it, let's say. I know um, Mark Stewart did an interview with the FT, didn't he, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about the enforcement pipeline, and he, he was indicating there are more criminal prosecutions in there. Not, not, not a huge number, but yeah, considering, considering the NatWest one was the first, um then the, the, the said there's a pipeline of, of, of more to come albeit it was a pain to to say you know that the, the, this will um you know they'll they'll uh they'll resolve <laughs> when 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 uh when the timing allows when uh um and, and you know based on the circumstances of each case um but it did sound to me like uh like there was a commitment to continue criminal prosecutions where they think they can land the case and I'm, and I'm sure that's right but but the resource demands of doing them are enormous so if you look at Nikhil Rati's letter back to the TSC he talks about however many you know millions of documents <coughs> and you know yeah, right. some years so, and, and so, so on and so forth yeah, so, so 300,000 man hours or something yeah so self hours you're not going to be doing that at the drop of a hat and, and you're automatically pulling resource away from something else from you know 20 other cases that you might be prosecuting instead or whatever the number is. Um, it's probably smaller than that, but you know what I mean? Um, so it's not a, you know, there's, a, there's there are trade offs in all this. And unless you're going to have a much bigger enforcement unit, um, which you might do, then it's hard to imagine there being um, anything <clears throat> like a regular, um, a regular sequence of these. Well, Cut back to our earlier conversation, which is an open question as to as to what extent the, the regulator may be pivoting to being more enforcement led. Um, uh, it's a possibility. Um, which is space. Um, it would probably cost more money, though. Uh, in yes, terms of fees. That's true. That's true. And of course, the fees at the moment go back to government by and large. So it's not like nice. you know they come. <laughs> It's there's not a there's not a, a sort of a, a a sort of natural income stream to fund enforcement cases, which is intended by Parliament. I'm not criticising it, but it does constrain what you can do with enforcement. Um, let's take a, a canter through some of the new consultations, rules, statements, um, communications from from the the different regulators. Um, so the PRA is issued. Uh, it's three standard letters, I, I say standard because it's obviously issued these before, on their supervisory priorities for um, UK banks, international banks and insurers, so there's three, three letters. Um, uh, nothing dramatically new or unexpected in them, I don't, I don't think. I know, Gavin, you were you were looking at them in some, some detail, I think quite a lot of continuity. Um, yes, no, no surprises, like you say. Um, I, I sort of impressive amount of coordination between them. I mean, it's it's essentially three versions of one letter, mm. which would be very hard to do in the FCA, which is much more decentralized. I think it might even be a bit of a first for the PRA. I don't remember that level of coordination with them all coming out at the same time. Uh, and I think the other thing worth saying is that it looks particularly on the UK banks agenda like the busiest time they've had um, since the you know since the formation of the PRA probably 
if you take into account all the post COVID Archego stuff plus climate change, uh, yeah, yeah, operational resilience, you know, there's a there's yes. a big agenda there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it it does cross your eye, and then you know, thematic work on modelling. Yeah, it's regulatory reporting as well. Added added onto onto those. It is there's quite a lot going on there. Um, you are, I think the insurance one does look a bit a bit less dramatic. Although there we might have, you know, longer term thinking on solvency two and, and its application mm. in the UK. So I guess in the in the long term, the regulatory position of the insurers could could change more significantly than than, than the banks. Um, actually, is it worth just just at this point reflecting on? It's not the first time we've talked about ring fencing and and uh, how that's uh, succeeded or otherwise has it accomplished its goals. But the, the, we did uh, in the last few weeks see um, a interim statement from the Skioch Ring Fencing Review, uh, and there's also the FSB has, has, has published some content as well in the not too distant past, um, uh, which. You know, a, I think we we both agree it's positive that that, that that it's being reviewed. You know, the the success of what is obviously an absolute absolutely landmark policy to to to, to spring fence the retail banking arms of from uh, uh, from uh, you know high risk theoretically uh, investment banking businesses. Um, that we think it's 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 very important that 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 is reviewed and its effectiveness is assessed. I think uh, just to summarise what we're seeing in terms of these interim assessments, uh, it's too soon to tell, I think would be, <laughs> is, that the, is that the best way of characterising it? No evidence either way, particularly. Um, yes, I think so. I mean, there is there is evidence, but 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 it's not, I don't think it's, it, it's, it's not a slam dunk. Uh, and I suppose my big thing is that it's not really been properly tested. So the the FSB one, which was last April, which is a wider review of too big to fail reforms, of which ring fencing is obviously a UK part of the UK um, uh, sort of agenda on that, uh, talks about, you know, whenever banks have failed in the interim, governments have actually stepped in still. Yeah. So, so no bank of any size has been has been allowed to fail in an orderly fashion yeah. in the way that was envisaged when these reforms were first initiated. Uh, and I think we're still in that position. Um, and I suppose the other thing is that, you know, COVID distorts quite a lot of stuff. There's a lot of other things going on, including quantitative easing and so on, which which materially affect how the whole system structure reform works. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it's good to keep looking at it. It's really fundamental. It has costs, mostly intended ones. Um, and you need to assess whether they're still worth paying. But but actually, you know, if it does what it's meant to do, then that's really good, important thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, looking at other um, points, the uh, the the. the the Bank of England is obviously involved in um, operational resilience. <clears throat> There's a lot of been work done with the banks already on that. Um, but I just wanted your views on on the extent to which um, the focus is now pivoting or seems to be pivoting to the to the big cloud providers, uh, um, most of which are American companies, as it as it, as it happens. Um, you know, and is there a, it, it, to what extent to what extent uh, it, it, it's clear what expectations are going to be for firms uh, when they're, um, you know, most of their <laughs> most of their critical services are sitting on Amazon Web Services, for instance. Yes, um, I, I think this is really fascinating. Uh, and I, you know, I don't pretend to know the answer. Uh, I think that, I mean, having talked to a few people, um, I'm just standing back, it's hard to envisage regulators wanting to um, take responsibility for what's going on in the cloud, um, even in a kind of, you know, it's OK today, will it be OK tomorrow sort of way. Um, and we know that those big tech platforms don't like being the idea of being scrutinized, let alone formally regulated. Um, maybe go into that another time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but at the same, but having said all that, there is something about you know, central banks and regulators can't stand by and not look at 
not have any kind of scrutiny or oversight of the cloud when so much of the financial systems and our own personal data is kept there. So there's there needs at some point to be some kind of mechanism to give a reasonable level of assurance that actually things are as you would want them to be. And the standards will keep changing because you're going to have, you know, people trying to hack and so on in different ways. And I'm sure they're, you know, they're they're dead safe, much safer than almost any bank would be. But nonetheless, there's a lot, you know, you can't just assume. So at some point, this is, you know, so this is going to have to move over time. But I've no idea where it will settle or how long it will take. Yeah, no, no, I agree. It's 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 um it's a fascinating and vast challenge for the regulators. If if they're really serious about operational resilience, then you know it's going to need to be tackled probably on an international basis. Yeah. At, at some point, it's just uh, too glaring a um too glaring an omission to leave. Um, looking at looking at other news. Uh, this one will affect all the football fans in our audience because the their shirt sponsors might well be finding life is getting difficult. Um, uh, I, I think I'm right in saying that every football team is sponsored by a crypto um, <laughs> provider. I may be generalising slightly, um, but uh, but the FCA obviously obviously the law is going to change. So so crypto promotion the promotion uh, of crypto assets is going to be pulled into the FCA's perimeter. The FCA is already talking about how this aligns with their consumer investment strategy, and they are talking about how crypto um, promotions will be. Uh, I think the terminology, new terminology, is going to be a restricted mass market investment, which basically means, uh, you know, a, a the promotion would need to be signed off by an authorized firm. B um, only high net worth, sophisticated investors uh, or people meeting those kind of thresholds would be allowed to respond to those promotions. So on the face of it, you know, making making life a lot a lot more difficult for for um, <clears throat> people that want to get you to buy uh, crypto assets. Um, and they're talking about final rules by the summer of 2022, which is uh, uh, so later this year, which is um, it's, it's going some. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's this is this is the first big move, is it not, into the FCA getting its hands on crypto? Well, I, I think it's it's definitely the first move. How how big it is, I'm I'm a bit less sure. Um, I mean, financial promotions are very hard to regulate. Full stop. Um, you know, they're not just UK based for starters. So you're talking about UK UK regulated firms um, marketing in the UK. Essentially, you're not talking about non UK firms. Yeah. Or marketing overseas. Um, going back to your your Twitter comment earlier, I, I looked it up, and the FCA now has just under sixty five thousand followers on Twitter, of whom you and I are two. Uh, I'm not sure how many of those will be the eighteen to thirty year olds who are investing in crypto, who they're allegedly who they say they're targeting. So, I mean, I think it's really important to do, and I think it is a first step. I, I I suppose I just think there's an awfully long way to go with this, and yeah. the, the scale of the problem is just getting bigger. Well, the scale of the issue, you can debate how big a problem it is. Yeah, I, it's and just getting bigger all the time. It's 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 really interesting because, yeah, I mean, it, 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 my my reaction to this is, is it kind of has to be done. Uh, you know, the 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 the, the whole, whole idea of having a you know, a rational regulatory system means it has to be done. However, I say to myself, you know, probably those 18 to 30 year olds are getting quite excited about buying crypto, uh, probably don't feel like they want to be protected. Um, and secondly, they're technically savvy enough not to, <laughs> you know, they'll find find ways to to, to, to buy yeah, Bitcoin or uh, all the other um, flavours thereof. Um, yeah. Irrespective so, of what so I mean, I think you know the, the FCA spent is spending eleven million on the campaign, which is which is great. Um, but but and it's a big number for the FCA, but it's not a it's not a lot when we're talking about you know Formula One advertising, um, and you know Premier League football advertising, and you know. Los Angeles Lakers naming rights to the stadium and so on and so forth. You know, it's it's just uh, it's it's just mammoth. This, 
Yeah. Uh, so, so we'll see. Yes. So I can't uh, get too excited at the moment. No, no. I mean, arguably, you know, the uh, if, if one of those cryptocurrencies blows up and a lot of people lose money, I think that will probably have a more sobering effect than the amount of, of regulation, frankly. So um, we shall see. Um, I know you noticed you were looking at uh, the, uh, the the FCA publish uh, the SMCR document, so they 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 yeah. uh, organise themselves along SMCR principles. This is something they've done since those rules were introduced, uh, and and uh, they produce a document which sets out accountabilities, how their governance structure works, and what, what individual accountabilities the, the senior team have, etc. Um, and I know you, you you were looking at you noted that crypto seemed to be um, not entirely strangely absent, but 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 not clearly uh, clearly picked out. Yes, I mean it looks now as though it's it's uh, director's supervision and policy for markets, but but clearly, I mean it's a good example actually because you, in order for the SCA to work effectively on this, you clearly need enforcement on board in terms of prioritising cases, and because you're talking retail consumers and retail investors, you clearly need. Um, uh you know the kind of the, the consumer side of supervision and policy involved too so you have quite a big matrix thing going on and how that works internally with regard to how quickly you can take decisions of what size how the governance works and so on is fundamental to smcr and fundamental to how effective the fca as an organization is going to be in in, in terms of its sort of you know strategy for crypto regulation uh you know so so it, it's so when you look at the so the smcr thing for the fca is is fascinating but it it, it does need quite a lot of unpicking which i'm going to try and do over the next few weeks um uh, and i think as i say crypto is a good example but there are lots of others i mean all the specialist supervision mm -hmm. stuff financial crime um you know prudential operational resilience that there's lots of crossover going on. Interesting. Uh, well, I, 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 uh, yeah, there's about a hundred, hundred plus page document. So <clears throat> uh, I uh, admire your courage to, to delve into the detail of that. Um, so some, some, some quickies. Uh, uh, we will deal next month, I think, in a bit more detail about the uh, the consultation the FCA issued on appointed representatives. So upgrading there. Um, expectations of principal firms, uh, which I think is going to be quite a significant uh, development and, and not, not one we can cover in the time we have available today. But uh, but for those businesses which do have ARs, they should definitely be reading that consultation. Um, uh, we, we've seen the FCA kick off some thematic work in relation to uh, ESG funds, so um, uh, funds with a sort of social and, and, and uh, uh, environmental um, label to them and the extent to which you know they're delivering the value or the expectations of customers so there's, uh, there's some really thematic work there which i think could be quite quite interesting to see how that evolves um and the european union has extended its uh um flexibility regarding eu institutions using uk clearing houses for uh for wholesale markets uh transactions so um that particular cliff edge has been pushed off. Interestingly for me, I mean, that, that they've sort of nudged that forward a, a year at a time, but they've actually extended that to 2025. Um, so we've got a, you know, a little slightly longer uh, a period to, to wonder what will happen next. Um, uh, we um, saw uh, the SWIFT review. Um, so that was the review of the, how the regulator uh, responded to the interest rate hedging products um issues and and the, and, the, and the and the various steps they they took during during that that process which obviously involved some very large scale redress exercises um so that that came out in december the report and the fca have responded one of the things that uh, was was quite interesting was um they they took two years longer i think the swift report to 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 be produced um and one of their recommendations is that the fca should consider including post-termination cooperation obligations in the employment contracts of all senior FCA personnel, which I think might, might be an indicator they didn't maybe get the get the assistance they, they hoped for. Um, uh, but you've obviously taken a little time to look at that. What, uh, what are your takeaways from that? I mean, I think it's quite, there's quite a lot of fundamental stuff in there. So I, I suppose there's two things. One is um, it goes back to, you know, something that happened in the early 2010s 
So this is, you know, when the FSA was turning into the FCA or that bit of it. Uh, so this is quite this is quite long ago stuff, but it's still relevant. And then I think actually folding all these recommendations into on top of everything else, LCF and so on into the transformation just kind of creates layers of complexity, which will be hard for the organization to kind of track. And I suspect that actually some of the recommendations here aren't entirely consistent with the um, the Gloucester report recommendations. Um, so if you look at these in, you know, and indeed comment, if you look at them all together, I suspect you have quite a complicated um, sort of Gordian knot of, of of kind of what to be doing next. Well, at least, I mean, the timing of this is is, is uh, interesting in that um, so the FCA have indicated they're, they're looking into potential industry level redress schemes on the British Steel Pension Scheme, uh, pension transfer challenges. So, so maybe there's uh, maybe there'll be some learnings that are applied across to that exercise. We shall see. Yeah. Um, I uh, I think we are probably at, at our time for the day, Gavin. And still lots more to talk about. We didn't even mention cost of living and what that might be uh, might might imply for regulators. We shall definitely do that next month. However. Um, uh, let's say thank you to all our listeners for joining us uh, for this month. Um, we are in the process of updating our regulatory handbook, which uh, will be available on our website during February. Um, so if you want to, uh, to to get your hands on a document which uh, sets out all of the main regulatory initiatives and their impact on different sectors, then uh, I uh, strongly suggest you, you take a look at that next month. Um, Gavin, thank you for your time. Um, Enjoy your birthday party in the meantime, <laughs> or somebody's birthday party, anybody's birthday party, and I'll uh, speak to you soon. All right. Take care, David. Bye-bye.